Hello and welcome for this special edition of Tech24 dedicated to Energy Observer. Like an ambassador for the environment, this former racing boat powered solely by renewable energies is on a six-year voyage around the world to prove that a cleaner future is indeed possible. In this edition, we'll speak to the expedition leader, Jérôme de la Fosse. For the last year or so, we've been following here on Tech24 this odyssey for the future. The aim for the crew aboard Energy Observer is to show that if they manage to tour the world on renewable energies in such an unpredictable environment, then in a near future, we will all succeed in applying these technologies to our homes, our cities, and perhaps entire nations. Well, I'm very pleased to introduce you to the expedition leader, professional scuba diver and documentary filmmaker, Jérôme de la Fosse. Thank you so much for joining us here. Um, Energy Observer has just finished the first leg of its voyage touring France. Looking back, what was the most memorable moment for you? Oh, I think to me it was, um, well, there was many great moments, but I would say that uh, uh, to go through uh, Gibraltar Strait, was uh, one of the highlights of, of, uh, of this trip because it's mythical. I mean, and it's the first boat ever, I mean, the first boat with uh, renewable energies and uh, hydrogen to go through this strait. And uh, well, that's, that was a dream came true. Uh, especially for an explorer, I can, I can imagine. The boat itself is a moving tech laboratory. You have over 180 square meters of solar panels on the roof, wind turbines, but also uh, a hydrogen fuel cell system. Um, what are the conclusions that you were able to draw throughout this Tour de France after testing this energy grid in, in sometimes difficult conditions? Now, first, I would say that uh, it's very positive because the boat uh, could sail about 4,000 nautical miles, which is huge uh, for a first experience and a prototype. But um, of course, in this kind of uh, scientific uh, project, you have problems. Okay, you, you encounter things uh, to improve. Uh, I would say that the, um, all the solar technologies, solar panels really worked well. I mean, we were really propelled by the sun. Um, and I would say also, which was a big challenge of uh, this uh, adventure, is um, the hydrogen uh, production chain, which uh, worked really well. We actually produced hydrogen from uh, seawater. And, uh, and that's a kind of magical, because you know, when you propel a boat like this, just with the energy of nature, I mean, that's really magical. You know it's going to work, but when it works, actually, that's completely amazing. After that, we have to improve um, the, the wind turbines. We, doesn't, um, we don't uh, produce as much uh, energy as we hoped uh, initially. And of course, the kite, which is a, a work in progress. And now, did you encounter some tech innovations or projects that really impressed you? Yes, we had a great uh, experience uh, in the island of El Hierro, in the south of Canary Islands. And there, um, I mean, that's the first island uh, that works 100% with renewable energies. And uh, I was amazed to meet the people who initiated this project. And, and I could understand that it was um, a tech uh, challenge, but it's also a political challenge. And uh, I think uh, now, uh, for the future, uh, the change will come from of course, the technology, but also from the um, uh, the, polit the, the politics, and uh, and we have. I mean, it's this also a political motivation. Yes, completely, and that's. Uh, a, I mean, that's very important that people keep this in mind because they have the power to change things. Well, we do hope that our political leaders heard uh, your message. Now, as a documentary filmmaker and a professional scuba diver, uh, you've been witnessing firsthand how oceans are becoming more and more polluted. And some of our, of our viewers may not know this, but uh, one of the main reasons is linked to sea transport. Just imagine that a single cargo ship uses as much fuel as a million cars. But engineers around the world are coming up with ideas to curb their gas emissions. Emerald Maxwell takes a look at the green cargo vessels of the future. They pollute more than all the cars in the world put together. And to sail the high seas, they consume heavy fuel, the most harmful type for our lungs. This juggernaut burns up to 300 tons per day, spewing out enormous quantities of sulfur and fine particles. But could electricity, giant kites, or spinning cylinders help make the cargo ship of the future cleaner. This company believes they can. 
It makes sails powerful enough to propel giant vessels. This system can reduce fuel consumption by 20%. To propel a big boat, you need a lot of sailcloth, 1,600 square meters for a container ship, and very strong rigging. Consume less to pollute less. That will soon be obligatory. In 2020, a global 0.5% cap on sulfur in marine fuel will enter into force. So engineers are stepping in. They've come up with rotor sails, spinning cylinders that create a sideways force which propels a ship forward, meaning less fuel is needed. This shipping group has been preparing for the new rules for some time. From this control tower, they plot the most efficient routes for their container ships. Between 2005 and 2015, we reduced our carbon emissions per container by 50 percent. And that's not all. Electricity may one day power all boats at sea, too. In December, China launched the world's first electric cargo ship, and Norway is developing its own vessel. Equipped with batteries, both can sail up to 80 kilometers on a single charge. For longer journeys, though, electric shipping remains uncharted territory. Now, Jérôme, you're about to embark on the second chapter of this expedition, touring this time the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, how many ports will you visit, and is there one in particular that you're looking forward to? Yes, we are leaving at the end of uh, March uh, towards um, the African coast, and we will tour all the Mediterranean. So we will visit about 16 uh, ports. Uh, we will film and meet people who are just um, uh, challenging uh, the uh, energetic and ecological transition. And uh, of course, uh, we get um, Cairo, Alexandria, but also Venice, which is for us, uh, I mean, uh, um, a place uh, with um, great stakes. Right, an endangered future, port as of well. Course. Jérôme de la Fosse, thank you so much, the expedition leader of Energy Observer. Moving on now to electric vehicles that are often presented as a solution to reduce carbon emissions. But the energy storage batteries needed to power these cars are turning out to have a greater environmental footprint than expected. They often require large quantities of assorted metals and minerals in their manufacturing process. So some scientists here in France are developing new types of batteries with a longer lifespan. This battery could revolutionize how energy is stored, paving the way for greener power units. Made using carbon, it can be recycled more easily, thereby minimizing its environmental impact. We use a vertically aligned carbon nanotube, which is like a, a, a toothbrush, you know. You have these tiny tubes, 60, less than 60 nanometers in diameter and 100 micrometers in, uh, in length, that gives you a very high specific surface that is fully accessible by ions. Developed by Nawa Technologies in anticipation of the growing transition to electric power, it can be quickly charged and discharged over a million times. For now, the ultracapacitor is discharged. We will use a very strong current that will charge it very quickly. Now it's stable at 2.2 volts. It got charged in a few seconds. Able to deliver fast bursts of current, it's ideal for applications such as electric vehicles and power tools. On the other side of France, another startup is trying to reduce the environmental impact of batteries by using sodium, a much more abundant, easily accessible and less expensive material than lithium. Sodium ion batteries allow you to have a fast charge. For instance, for a scooter or a bicycle, it can charge within three or five minutes. And also with sodium ion batteries, we can have several cycles, more cycles than in lithium batteries. It can last for years and years in comparison with lithium ion batteries. What's more, their formats remain identical, which makes sodium devices widely usable. This is our product. You could find this format in a Tesla, for example, the Model S. What changed in our product is uh, the electrodes. Basically, they are covered with our sodium ion active materials, whereas you would find a lithium ion active material in the, in the Tesla cells. Both these innovations don't aim to replace lithium ion batteries completely, but rather complement them. They'll hit the market in 2020, at a time when electric vehicles and greener energy storage solutions are set to become the norm. 
Dan and Jay Kattelkar, thank you so much for that report. Now, within electric vehicles, there are some batteries that contain rare earth elements. What exactly are they and where are they used? Well, there are 17 rare earth elements. 15 of them are called lanthanides. You can see at the bottom, it starts with lanthanum. And that's why they are named lanthanides, because most of them uh, have similar properties to lanthanum. And there are two more elements, scandium and yttrium. Now, their names are quite interesting. Like here, you can see uh, there's an element called lutetium, which is named after the uh, Latin name of Paris, lutetia. Right. There's also an element called europium. Uh, these uh, appear in uh, complex uh, minerals, and that's why they're very difficult to yield, very tough to yield. So you need high energy for mining them. And not only that, they also contain some uh, radioactive elements. So when you're mining, there's a danger that these radioactive elements will get released into the air or water, and there are because of these mining processes, some uh, toxic elements are also released. So that's why uh, scientists are trying to find new alternatives to these elements. But right. importantly, they cannot be substituted immediately because they have multiple uses. Like, for example, neodymium is used in making powerful magnets that are used in hard drives. They are also used for speakers. So in our phones, they are, they are there. In all high-tech devices, Absolutely. Then lanthanum is used in the batteries, uh, as you mentioned, in the electric vehicles. So each, uh, uh, each battery of a hybrid electric vehicle contains 10 kilograms of lanthanum. And so you can see that uh, they, have, they have played a stellar role in modern electronics and right. automobile industry. It's becoming so important that sometimes it's a diplomatic issue. Absolutely. It was in 2010 that China temporarily blocked the exports of uh, rare earth elements to Japan over an incident related to their maritime territorial dispute. Thank you, Dan. Well, that brings us to the end of this week's edition of Tech 24. But we're going to leave you with these beautiful pictures of the expedition Energy Observer. Thanks for watching, and do stay with us here on France 24.